Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spine Time. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm the Director of Neurosurgery Spine at Weill Cornell and the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care, together with my co-directors and the other staff at the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. I want to welcome you to Spine Time. I hope uh, you're having a happy new year and you and your family are staying safe during these still very challenging times. I want to walk you a little bit through the Spine Center for those of you who haven't joined us. As you know, we are located on 59th Street and 2nd, 2nd Avenue in, in Manhattan. And not only do we have spinal surgery here, but we work together in an interdisciplinary fashion with multiple other specialties that all together take care of patients with spinal problems, pain management, rehabilitation medicine, complementary medicine. Uh, we have an orthopedic surgeon here and, and, and uh, neurology at the Spine Center. Uh, so we're trying to provide a multidisciplinary approach to really help you through the diagnosis, the treatment and the recovery from your spinal problems. That's the background. Every, every, two, year, every two weeks, we're uh, putting together a spine time webinar where we're trying to address topics that we think and we know are of, of special interest to you, the patients, and some also the staff at the, at the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. And today, it's my special pleasure and my um, really privilege to welcome two of the co-directors here of the Spine Center to talk about uh, the value and the purpose of research at a spine center such as the one that we are here uh, on 59th Street. So we have Dr. Uh, Singh, uh, Ricky Singh, who is the vice chair and associate professor of clinical rehabilitation medicine here at Weill Cornell and one of the co-directors of the Spine Center. And then Dr. Neil Mehta, associate professor of clinical anesthesiology and uh, an associate attending anesthesiologist at, at Weill Cornell and also one of the co-directors of the Spine Center. Both are researchers, uh, but obviously also very, very busy clinicians. I want to get started by just maybe saying a few word, words about medical research in general. Um, obviously, it is important because uh, it allows us to prevent, cure, or treat diseases and related human conditions. It makes lives easier for our patients. Medical research has been responsible for hundreds of groundbreaking discoveries that, has improved, that, that, that have improved and saved lives, enabled healthcare to become more effective and efficient, and lowered overall healthcare costs. And I think we see that especially when it comes to musculoskeletal problems and spine care and neurosurgical care. One example that is, I think, very, very interesting and very obvious to all of us is really the incredible research that has been done over the past year to discover a vaccine for COVID. That's really the best example. And, uh, you know, some of you maybe uh, have been vaccinated already. But if you just look at this slide here that shows you how long it used to take to come from a diagnosis or an ident identification of the pathogen that's causing a disease to the actual vaccination, uh, how, how that has really evolved over the years and how fast it was. Now, in this particular case with COVID, with typhoid fever, it took 100 years to develop, to develop a vaccination. Mumps, it took 30 years. Measles, about 15 years. And with COVID, this was all done within, within one year. And that's all because of medical research. And um, I want to I wanna get started now, maybe uh, come to our uh, panelists here. And maybe we'll start with Ricky Singh. So Ricky, welcome again. First question to you, have you been vaccinated yet? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I was going to give my uh, public service announcement saying we are pro-vaccine. You know, all of us on the panel have been vaccinated. It's safe and effective. I get my second dose next week. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. But yes, you know, the research is tremendous how soon they pumped out this vaccine and shown its safety and efficacy. Um, and at New York Presbyterian, we've done a fantastic job of inoculating almost 40 or 50,000 individuals, healthcare workers, frontline workers. So yes, I'm vaccinated and uh, we're looking forward to the second dose. That's great. And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, walk through some of the research that we're doing here at Wild Cornell at the, at the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. And I would ask each of you maybe just to highlight, we're gonna show a bunch of slides, but I, you know, I don't wanna make this too academic. 
maybe just give, give us like the highlights of the one or two research projects that are ongoing at the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care that you're really excited about and that really probably characterize kind of like the nature of the type of work that we're doing here. So we'll start, Ricky, we'll start with you and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue with Neil. Sure. Uh, first, I love that you show the picture of me and Neil from when we first started working here at Wild Cornell. So I hope that uh, the audience thinks we still look the same, even though these pictures are about 10 years old. Um, but to answer your question about research, you know, I think it took some time to figure out what I was interested in. You know, you come out of residency, you come out of fellowship, and your job is to see patients, treat pain, neck pain, back pain, hip and joint. And it really takes some time to figure out where you want to go with clinical research, what are the questions your patients are asking you? And if it wasn't for the fact that we all are clinicians, I think we wouldn't be asking ourselves the right question. So the fact that there's so many patients on this panel today, I mean, you guys are the reasons we have these research questions. And one of the things that intrigues me the most is the field of regenerative medicine uh, or orthobiologics. And I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years that I've been here and the next 10 or 15 years, what that holds is gonna be very exciting. Uh, some of the projects that we like to work on at the Spine Center um, are using bone marrow or even adipose as a, as a stem cell to manipulate degenerative disc pathology or joint disease in order to kind of restore function of the joints. And in the lab, we've accomplished tremendous things. And what that translates to into the patients still remains to be determined. So we have many studies looking at harvesting different types of stem cells from the body, again, whether it's through your blood, something called platelet-rich plasma, or in your bone marrow. Bone marrow have a high quality of stem cells, or even in your adipose tissue. We have done a few small liposuction procedures in the clinic here, and then injected those cells and grafts into various areas. Uh, so that excites me. We've published some papers on it, pilot studies. We're looking at bigger research, which can further the field. And it would be impossible to do this without collaboration with my colleagues, both with Neil and with Roger Hartle. Um, and that's kind of the focus of my research. You know, I, I list this slide here, look at how many papers that we've published with different providers and different disciplines. And that would not be possible unless we worked side by side. And you can look at the pictures on the panel. Uh, you see me, you see Dr. Mata, and you see Dr. Hartle. We are all in offices right next to each other on the same floor. And we see each other, you know, 50 times a day and we ask each other questions about patients. And I think that's really what leads to tremendous collaboration when it comes to furthering the field of spine care and regenerative biologics. Um, and that's what excites me. So I, I'm looking forward to what the next few years hold in terms of regenerative area. And I, again, I couldn't do it without my colleagues here and certainly without the patients asking us the right questions. Ricky, thanks a lot. So your focus clearly is regenerative medicine, which is very exciting and it's very, very vibrant and really promising area with it, within spinal research. And, and, and we do uh, some basic science work in that uh, area as well. Let's move on, Neil. Maybe tell us. So Neil, again, is, uh, is our co-director for um, in the Spine Center. His specialist is really pain medicine, pain management medicine. So, so, so Neil, tell us a little bit about your, your research. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Ricky. Uh, pleasure to be here speaking with our audience and, and, and part of this wonderful group. I listed here the active studies that are going on in, in pain management. And when, when I say uh, pain management, it really actually is involving the entire spine center. And there are, there are some themes here uh, that may, may um, kind of envelop all the, the studies. Most of them are technology-based. The ability to understand how do we capture information, what patients are experiencing, what they're, what they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we use that information in between the visits they may have with us and hone in their, their diagnosis and treatment as we go. So we have studies that involve questionnaires that patients fill out both during their visit and also uh, during the time in between visits, and also uh, applications that they use to track their, their progress. So how do they use uh, their walking, their exercise? How does it show differences in between visits that we are using treatments? And it helps us understand if these things are effective. 
We also look at the technology of spinal cord stimulation, which is essentially like a pacemaker for the spine. We've had previous webinars on that. And using this in various treatments like back pain, neck pain. And most recently we completed enrollment in a study for treating severe neuropathy from diabetes related to um, uh, the use of spinal cord stimulation. So our, our research is always generally practical. We want to be able to find answers that we can relay to patients in a short amount of time. And this may differ from basic science research, which takes longer, but often can be very impactful as well. Um, and then also the ability for patients to use this in their care in between visits. So uh, not only are we gathering information, but it makes a direct impact on you as a patient. Yeah, Neil, thank you. So your focus is really pain modulation, spinal cord stimulation, pain modulation, different types of medications potentially for the types of problems that we see here in the spine center. So very, very focused on, on really the things that we see every day in the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. Um, I, wanna, I wanna move on and just uh, uh, maybe uh, give you a little bit from the surgical perspective. You know, me, me as the surgeon, we, we, have a, uh, you know, we have a group of uh, now six spine surgeons here at the Spine Center. And uh, each one of us does research in conjunction with the rest of the Spine Center, but also with outside organizations, with organized neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgery around the country and really around the world. And there are a lot of uh, papers that come and, and research articles that come out of that work. This is an article by Dan Rue, who recently joined us. He's an orthopedic spine surgeon. He's an expert for cervical spine surgery. It's a paper that he published with colleagues based on his patient experience on how to make decisions for cervical spinal surgery. This is a paper from Eric Elowitz, who is really a leader now when it comes to endoscopic spine surgery. So really minimal invasive approaches to the lumbar spine. Paper that he published recently uh, uh, looking at some of the new research approaches in terms of maximizing the efficiency and the safety of endoscopic spine surgery. This is a paper published by uh, Michael Verk, who's uh, one of our spine surgeons here, looking at the comparison of traditional and minimal invasive spine surgery. And uh, here also a paper by Kai Fu, who is uh, another one of our spine surgeons who is really an expert in deformity surgery. Again, and he's looking with a group of uh, experts around the country at the uh, benefit of minimal invasive spinal surgery. So a lot of what we do, as you can see here, is really not only treating patients, but we're constantly involved in academia and research in the spine center, but also outside the spine center. And the focus is really on re regenerative medicine, pain modulation, new technologies, minimal invasive surgery. And, uh, and this is one, one paper that we published a few years ago and a lot of patients that I see really benefit from this paper in particular. This is research that showed us that in patients who have lumbar spinal stenosis, you can see that MRI scan here in the corner on the right side, we have severe nerve compression with lumbar spinal stenosis and they have spondylolisthesis, meaning there's some slippage there. The question is always, do these patients really need a fusion operation or can you treat this without having to do a fusion? And this research here clearly shows that you can treat these patients very, very successfully and very safely without having to do a fusion operation with a minimal invasive laminectomy. And this is a paper, for example, that won a uh, award at, uh, at one of the uh, biggest meetings uh, in neurosurgery as the best spine paper of the year. So we're, we're constantly trying to really push the field forward. This is our basic science work on regenerative research here where we're using tissue engineering in the lab so far and in animals to regenerate diseased discs and to repair diseased discs. So this is really more at the basic science level, but we're hoping that especially our work in biological disc repair will soon be used in the spine center here uh, for the benefit of our patients. Now, uh, I wanna, I wanna uh, go a little bit uh, into a discussion uh, because there are a lot of questions when it comes to research, of course. And, and, um, and, and one of the questions that I am always thinking about, what, as a patient, uh, what, what's really the benefit for the patient to come to an academic center? 
you, or does a patient have to be afraid that we're experimenting on patients, for example, or is there actually is the contrary true? Like Neil, Neil, what, what would you t- uh, tell a patient who asks, well, why should I come to an academic center? You're, going, you're just going to do research on me. Well, I often think of a of an example of things that have evolved over the years that we've been practicing. And without academic center research, we would be stuck doing the same thing day in, day out when there's an opportunity to do better. So you are parting a part of a cutting edge opportunity to advance the field, not only for humanity, but even for yourself. And not everything is research. I mean, we are clinicians at heart, as Ricky mentioned, that's our primary focus. Uh, but in, in addition to clinical care, we have missions of teaching and research to help advance the field. And so when you are part of a research study, it is very clear that we're seeking an answer to a question and you will be explained every process of that research project. But otherwise, an academic center provides you the latest and evidence-based care to hopefully make uh, the best improvement in your your health. Yeah, you know, I I agree, Neil and Roger. You know, we talk about what we do on a day-to-day as practice. You know, this is my practice, I'm in practice. And what's fascinating is we kind of really step back and think about why do we call this practice? This is my job, I'm not practicing anymore, it's my job. But in reality, the biggest frustration for us as clinicians along with the patient is when we offer a treatment that doesn't work. You know, we tell the patient you have back pain, it's going into your leg, you need an epidural, you're gonna get way better, and they don't. Then we say, okay, you need surgery, we need this microscopic disc replacement or remove the disc, you're gonna get better, and patients don't. And I know patients get frustrated because they wanna get better, but I tell you to the patients listening, we as physicians also get frustrated because we think what we're offering is going to help you, it is the best treatment, and yet it doesn't. And that's where these clinical questions come in. Like what else is there that we are missing? What other cutting edge technologies or innovation or medical device is out there that we haven't actually shown efficacy in a clinical setting? And that's where the equity of a patient really comes in to further the science. You know, without the patients, we'd be stuck in the stone ages doing the same things of eating roots for back pain instead of doing injections, microscopic surgery or medical devices. And I think that's kind of how I phrase it. You know, I had a patient today, we're doing a new study looking at steroid versus saline after a certain procedure, it doesn't make a difference. And I told her, for you, the patient, the outcome is gonna be the, be the same, but you're gonna teach me a lot as to whether steroid is really necessary to help you get better, or can I get away with without using steroid? And we're, gonna, we ask, we're asking that question, and hopefully in six months, we'll find that answer. Uh, but again, it's very, very valuable to us as clinicians to advance the field of pain medicine and spine care. I mean, that's why working in an academic center is so fulfilling, not just seeing patients, but also teaching and contributing to the literature. Thanks for walking us through that, Ricky and, and Neil. What, what are some of the things that we can offer patients here because we are a very experienced and very busy research center that, that they wouldn't be able to maybe uh, have you know, experience at other places? Well, I think one of the things you you highlighted before was the collaborative nature of the center and and the ability to do research, not just in my specific field, but to work with Ricky and and you, Roger, in the fields of neurosurgery and rehabilitation medicine. And that's unique of the, the design and the setup of our center. But also the ability to do studies with other centers that are of high caliber. So for example, uh, we are doing a spinal cord stimulation study on diabetes related neuropathy, as I mentioned. And the partners in that study are places like the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic. So you have the opportunity to have care in New York that you don't necessarily have to travel for. And because we're a cutting edge center, you have access to the latest and greatest uh, studies. So I think that's that's the really unique uh, chance here. And, and just to piggyback on that, just like you mentioned, when one of us has an ongoing study, all of us kind of know. So when, when I have a patient with diabetes and neuropathy, 
I can quickly refer them to Neil's group and say, hey, they're doing a really fascinating study. You might be a good candidate. And vice versa, Neil might have a patient with back pain who might need intradiscal stem cells. And he'll, he'll send those patients over. It's something you may not get the opportunity to experience if we worked in private offices or silos where there's less crosstalk. And, and also regarding what you said of being part of these multi-center studies with Mayo Clinic, and we're doing a study with UCLA and Hopkins and Harvard. These are tremendous opportunities for patients. You know, they're going to be contributing to the literature on, at a large scale. Um, and that's, that's one of the value adds that we can provide here at the Comprehensive Center. Yeah, and from my perspective, I think a lot of it has to do with safety. It is true that if you go to some of the other institutions or private clinics all over you know, the world, really, who, who claim that they take care of patients with spine problems, they may offer things that sound very, very exciting, but there's a lot of safety. I mean, in my opinion, there are a lot of safety concerns. If somebody doesn't collect the data and they don't really know how their patients are doing and they're not willing to really share that information with anybody, that makes me very, very suspicious. You know, I have patients who uh, think about going to stem cell places all over the world. Uh, but, but the problem is that these places frequently, not always, but frequently are not willing to share their data. And therefore, I think it's not safe to go there. Everything that we do here, all the data are being collected and there, a lot of it is being published. It's being available. And that's how we make sure that we're transparent. You know, we keep it, we keep, we keep everybody honest. And we're trying to make sure that at the end of the day, everything that we do, there's some type of evidence available that we're actually really helping patients. Uh, I think one of the eye-opening experiences as a new faculty member getting involved in research was just how rigorous the process was to get approval to start the study. And not only is there uh, a very detailed review of the study design, but also the number of people involved in looking at the safety of it, including the general public. So we have members of New York City population that sit on a committee that review the study to make sure that it's well-designed, that the research participant would understand what's being asked of them and what potential risk may be and that it's, it's understandable. Uh, so it's been eye-opening to me that the average study takes anywhere from three to six months to even get approved. And then you start the study, you collect the patient data and analyze it and just how much time it may take to, to get these things done. The other thing to mention is, is the benefit to the patient. You know, these these treatments that we're offering, like you mentioned, are cutting edge, are innovative. And a lot of these treatments would typically come at a cost to a patient, sometimes because insurance carriers or other payers won't pay for it. So we are lucky in the sense that many of the studies that we conduct here are either sponsored by industry or corporations. Um, the NIH, which is getting more and more challenging to fund these federally funded studies is, is a challenge. That's always a goal of us in academics. Uh, but truth be told, a lot of what we do is funded privately by philanthropy and donations. And without those, we couldn't advance the field. We couldn't offer regenerative treatments and these innovative devices. And I think that's, that's really valuable to the patient because they get exposed to these treatments and to us so we can, again, contribute to the science. Yeah, thanks, Ricky. That, that, that's a really important point that we didn't mention before. So, so we talked about the Spine Center. We talked about all the different types of research protocols that we have. Uh, we talked about the benefits for the patients and we then we talked about uh, you know kind of how we how we make this work. Let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure and, and what 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 our challenges are in, in really putting together research protocols and really advancing the field. Um, research depends on on people obviously and that's not only us but that's research staff we need people to you know we need staff to collect data to analyze data to write it up to publish it we need space uh, we need equipment and and we need funding at the end of the day maybe maybe uh, Ricky and, and Neil uh, tell us a little bit about your challenges uh, you you have a lot of experience doing research but what I like that the of those of those points that I listed here, which are the biggest challenges and how, how do you see, how do you overcome those? You know, I, what's exciting and frustrating is that when I first came here 10 years ago, there's only a few of us, a few of us in the department, 
uh, we had one research coordinator and any study that I wanted to do, I had support staff because, you know, there's only a few of us that did research. Now with the growing faculty of, we were four, now we're 17, many of the other faculty and attendings are interested in research and we have a fixed number of clinical research support staff. And that's sometimes what limits my ability to participate in other research. You know, Neil approached us a, a few months ago to collaborate on a study for knee arthritis. And I, of course, want to help because we have so many patients that I treat with knee arthritis. And my first question was, are you providing the research staff or do I? And if it's me, unfortunately, I can't because they're spread thin already. So support staff is very, very important for conducting research. You know, they do the consents, they help us with data collection and data analysis and publication preparation. So I think for my department, support staff and, and team members is the biggest challenge. Obviously in Manhattan, space is always a challenge. Real estate's a huge commodity here. Um, but if I could help my research program at all, it would be with a few more research coordinators and personnel. Neil, you've done a lot of work with um, databases, right? And uh, I, know, I know maybe you share a little bit of the challenges and the vision that we have here at the Spine Center for really using big data and data collection to improve the research. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Big data is exciting because it really helps us get detailed information to advance the field and help help our patients in a very quick manner. But it's very reliant on both the infrastructure, your, your computer system and how you access the data and the quality of the data that's getting entered. So if we have somebody that is entering data on paper uh, because they may have a challenge doing it on a computer, we need someone to then transcribe that into our database. Or if they're using a computer and maybe don't answer all the questions completely, we need a way to sift through that data to, to make sure that it fits in a way that we can then analyze it. So in our 10 year experience of big data collection, one thing that we have realized is the human element of helping capture that data, the interaction of a research assistant with our patients is really key. And it goes back to what Ricky talked about, which is staffing and funding to pay for that sort of thing. Many of the things that we do uh, are limited in terms of funding due to the challenges of receiving grants for this. So we rely on philanthropy and also we use, we offset some of the money that we collect from clinical care to fund these projects. And that's part of the academic mission is giving back through what we raise through our, our sort of business side of clinical medicine. Well, thanks. So let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about somebody maybe listening who, who would be interested in helping us one way or the other. What would you tell uh, patients or anybody interested in supporting the research here, what, what would be a good way to, to make that happen? I think, you know, first and foremost, we have a very professional and experienced uh, gifts office here. Uh, they have always helped us with funding and many patients of our own have said, you know, I want to contribute to Dr. Singh or Hartle or Metha's uh, uh, research. What's the best way to do that? So getting in touch with our gifts officers is probably the best way to start you know, a lot of the studies that we want to do are not eligible for federal funding because we don't have initial pilot data. And that's kind of where this private philanthropy really helps us. And they might be small studies, but just enough to get some initial data to then apply for these society grants or federal agencies to say, listen, we've shown proof of concept. Now let's bring this to the larger public. And, and again, without, without this funding, it's very, very difficult. So I think the first place to start would be to speak with our uh, donation and gifts officers. And how do yeah. they, and then they would obviously talk to us and we can get them in touch with that person. Uh, I'll give you an example that just happened last week. Uh, we had a, a patient that uh, unfortunately lost her, her spouse to cancer and really wanted to <clears throat> make the experience of cancer pain better. And we had a discussion of what was really meaningful to her. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I felt like communication and really relaying what my husband was feeling when he wasn't in your care was difficult. 
so we talked about a pilot project using a mobile device that helps capture data that we don't necessarily see during our office visits. And we're using that, that donation to design a bigger study. So essentially what Ricky said is we're doing a 10 person study and we'll use that information to look for a signal to then expand onto a bigger study. So that gift, while it wasn't small, was enough to start a project that could really change how we practice medicine. So I, uh, I, I'm just looking through the questions here. There are a lot of comments, a lot of questions. Some of them are not related to research and I apologize if we can't answer all of those. Some of these are actually related to how to support the, the research that we're doing here. And if you wanna help any of the doctors, the best way of really approaching that is really to talk to the doctors directly and, and we'll get you in touch with uh, the gift officer. We'll give you the different options that you have as a patient to really support our research. That's, that's the answer to one of the questions here. And, um, and then they have a few questions about uh, somebody has uh, von Willebrand's disease. Can, can, can you participate in, in clinical research? And you may be able to, it depends on the type of study. It really depends on the individual study. Uh, but just because you have that particular disease doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to participate in a study. Uh, another question is uh, related to uh, uh, lumbar spinal stenosis and a synovial cyst. Yes, there's minimal invasive surgery for that available, and we, we're studying that as, uh, as, as researchers, but we also treat this very, very successfully as, as surgeons experienced with minimal invasive spinal surgery, and I would encourage you maybe to contact my office. It sounds like this is more surgical, and I'll be happy to review that, and then we can make a decision in terms of who you should see for these problems. So, um, uh, uh, Neil, Neil and Ricky, uh, any, any final, what's your big vision? Where do you see your research going in five or 10 years? We've got to, we, we got to end it in a few minutes, but maybe give us like a big outlook. Like what's the big picture? Where do you see yourself uh, in the research arena and the clinical arena in five or 10 years from now? Uh, I, I mean, I, in a nutshell, I always think about that probably what we do day to day here today in terms of clinical practice is going to be outdated by the time we finish our research projects. And I think that's really exciting. I mean, the fact that we are moving the ball forward and, and using so much more data and technology that some of the our old ways of doing things will, will be out of date. And uh, I, I think that's where we're headed. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I always say the same thing, you know, when, when we started and in training, we are taught to use cortisone and steroids and that's the staple medication for procedures. And we know some of the systemic and deleterious effects of cortisone. So, which is why I became interested in regenerative medicine. And I hopefully in by the time we leave this practice, the next generation won't be using cortisone. They'll have something better in their arsenal. You know, the, what I'm excited about is, you know, this pandemic has certainly shifted the way we are delivering healthcare. You know, here looking at everybody on Zoom, I mean, this is second nature now. We do so many Zoom visits and virtual visits. And I think healthcare delivery has changed for the better for the patients because now the access to the physicians is much better. What we need to figure out is how we can optimize tracking outcomes, whether it's wearable technologies like Neil mentioned or Fitbits or Oura Rings or apps on their phone to really improve a patient's function. At the end of the day, whatever we do here at the Spine Center, whether it's medications or injections or surgery, is to improve the patient's function. We want them to be more mobile. We want them to play with their kids and grandkids and exercise the way they used to. Certainly COVID in the city has changed that with gyms being closing and social distancing and hopefully with the vaccine movement that will end. Uh, but another area of interest is, is the field of wearable technologies and how we can use that in our center to show clinical outcomes uh, to, to other centers and show that by working with one another, we really achieved good outcomes. So that excites me. I'm hoping that we can work on some projects with that. And again, the funding will certainly help us do so. Thanks, Ricky. I, I certainly, if I, in preparation for this webinar and then uh, listening to you guys, I realized that really all, everything that we do has to do with re research data collection. And we're constantly changing the way that we're taking care of patients 
And certainly in my own experience, if I look back 10 years, there's nothing that I do today in the operating room that is exactly the way that I used to do it 10 years ago. And these things really change. I would say every five years, there's tremendous amount of innovation with uh, the regenerative work that you do, Ricky, you know, the, uh, the way that we incorporate uh, neuro uh, and pain modulation, what, what Neil is working on and, and, and the way that we handle our patients. And then with minimal invasive surgery, endoscopic surgery and so forth, things are constantly changing. But I wanna, I wanna uh, thank all of you. Uh, I'll take a last look at the, uh, the questions here. Again, some of these questions are not really related to research and I hope we'll be able to and answer those uh, remotely. Um, one, the most important question at the end, Dr. Singh, did you have any side effects from the COVID uh, vaccination? <laughs> As a concerned patient of yours wants to know. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, I received the Pfizer vaccine two weeks ago. My left deltoid was sore for about 12 hours and then I um, fully recovered. So no real side effects. There are, there are documented reports of like fever and muscle aches, but it's like 0.001%. Um, so again, the safety and efficacy has been shown through the literature. Yeah, and hopefully hopefully the vaccine will be available for, for everybody very soon. Uh, I wanna wish all of you um, now we're, that we're coming to the end again, thanks for your patience, thanks for calling in. I wanna wish you a happy, happy new year, get the vaccination, be safe. And uh, Ricky and Neil, uh, thanks for being good partners and being part of this webinar again today. I wanna to thank Roseanne, Tatiana, everybody from the Wild Cornell Neurosurgery team who really put these webinars together. The webinars are gonna be available on YouTube. If you ever feel the urge to, to uh, go back and look at them. Uh, if uh, Ricky gave you the address of the Spine Center, 59th Street and 2nd Avenue, if you uh, want to visit us in person, make an appointment, or we do, of, of course, telemedicine consultations all the time. And uh, there are a lot of advantages to that. And we really encourage patients to take, take advantage of that. So again, Happy New Year. And thank you. And goodbye, everybody. Happy New Year. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.